Walker. I'm uh, Chairman of the Police Commission, and we're here tonight to uh, have a panel to talk to us, a panel of experts. And at this time, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Juan Carlos Valle, who is the chair of our committee that helped to put this all together. And he's going to take it from this point. Okay. I got the microphone, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't know if this works or not. You're welcome. You may not reach all the way down there. Joe? Is, uh, he was here just a minute ago. Is that working, Joe? Yes. Test. Okay. Test. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The police commission motion uh, to form a committee to accomplish two things: to put together a community panel and to hold a public forum regarding bias-based policing. The commission also wish to review the policy in one year if it is implemented. Commission, we are doing the first part tonight the community panel aspect of it. We have asked community members and experts to present five to six minutes um, in different areas. One, community historic context. Two, advocacy. Three, legal and case examples. Four, community experience. Five, perspective from an officer in the union. Six, policy implementation issues. And you also wanted to see uh, and hear about the collection stops committee that was convened by the chief of police. Very quickly, several people were contacted for these to participate in this uh, in this uh, panel. The committee used the selection process to come up with the final participants. Each panelist brings a very valuable perspective in many years of community service, helping our community, and to assist you in us in doing the work we're doing tonight. The bias-based policing committee are Commissioner Edward Caring, Commissioner Joe Tindall, Commissioner Bill Wayland, and George Shirley, acting as the chair of the committee. I want to take a quick moment to say thank you to, to our committee members. If you don't mind setting up just a second, Edward, and Joe, and Bill. Thank you for working so hard. In Flexible, and of course, to call a staff person for all the hours that she spent helping us out. Panelists, welcome once again. You have five to six minutes to present. Bill Whalen, over in the other end, is going to signal when you have one minute. Can you show that one minute? And also at 30 seconds to conclude your presentation. Commissioner, during this panel presentation, I ask that you hold your questions until all the panelists have concluded their presentation. I will keep a cue, and I will be the moderator for the, the person that will keep um, things moving. <coughs> Please get my attention if you want to do the cue. And audience, I ask that you are, you will help us by being courteous and to welcome our guest speakers. Commissioners, may I present Community Historic Context, Carmen Urbina. Carmen Urbina is a bilingual and bicultural press professional with 25 years of experience performing asset-based, complex, and targeted outreach in communities of color to implement effective parenting involvement and recruitment strategies in districts, schools, and community-based organizations. Next, advocacy, Ken Nubek. Mr. Nubek is a member of the Human Rights Commission for his work in projects involving the integration of immigrants into the community and the human rights of people who are homeless. Next, legal and case examples, Raquel Hecht. Raquel Hecht is an immigration attorney who has practiced immigration law in Eugene for the last 20 years. Community experience, Dr. Emilio Hernandez, Jr. Dr. Hernandez Jr. Has, was the Assistant Vice President in the Office of Equity and Inclusion at the University of Oregon. Prior to this appointment, he was the Director of the University of Oregon High School Equality Program, HEP, for 13 years. HEP assists uh, people to complete the GED certificate and guidance to in the in labor workforce. As a former farm worker and the oldest of six siblings, he knows the issues that face this population. During this period, he knows, excuse me, during this period, he also served for nine years at the State of Oregon Board of Education. 
serving under two governors and two public superintendents. Um, he was also the first Latino to be appointed to the board. Next, perspective from uh, an officer in, in the union, uh, Officer Jet McGuire. Mr. McGuire has been, in the police, he's been a police officer for 10 years. He serves as the executive board member of the Eugene Police Employees Association. The EPA has been the legally recognized exclusive collective bargaining unit for union representing strike prohibited, prohibited rank and file employees of the Eugene, Oregon Police Department since 1971. Mr. McGuire is also serving on the committee, which is advising the Chief Pete Kearns on the implementation of STOPS data collection as part of the update records management system. Next, policy implementation issues. Mr. Mark Gissner. Mr. Gissner is the independent police auditor for Eugene, Oregon, and has served in this capacity since 2009, with over 20 years of ex professional experience in external oversight. His field is oversight, policy recommendations, and quality assurance. And last but not least, Data Collection Stops Committee, Judge Kip Leonard. Uh, judge Leonard was the Lane County District Judge from 1986 to 1989, presiding judge from 1996 to 2000, and from 1989 to 2010, Lane County Circuit Judge. Judge Leonard retired in 2010. Judge Leonard has been the board chair of the Oregon Social Learning Center since 2012, board chair of the Center for Family Development since 2011, World Junior Track and Field Championship Coordinator since 2011, and he <laughs> is the co-chair for the Eugene Police Department Stops Data Collecting Project, project since 2013. <coughs> Panelists, may I call you by your first name? Thank you. So without further ado, we're gonna start with you, Carmen. Okay. You have the floor, go right ahead. Okay, first of all, I just wanna say thank you to the Police Commission for uh, putting forward this forum, and I know that there's going to be another community involvement forum to be able to get the voices. So the first thing that I would like to say is that um, you, I heard the word expert. I'm not an expert. I can only bring my experiences and share with all of you what I know in my perspective in the skin that I am in as a Latina woman living in this community. And so I define responsibility as the ability that we have to respond, and that's our individual responsibility and also the responsibility of systems. Next. The second thing that I would like to do is bring to this forum two elders that have taught me and were guides and um, that's and no longer with us in this life, and that's Dr. Robert Proudfoot and Dr. Dwight Sowers. And also I just want to recognize in the room elders in our community which are Ms. Lily Parker, Mr. Neil Lansberger, and Emilio Hernandez, which are, I consider, my elders and also have a plethora of information because they were they are part of our community and they can tell you much more than I will. Next. Having been in this community for a while, what I can tell you is sometimes when fishes don't know they're in a fishbowl and they absolutely don't know sometimes that they're swimming in water. And when we're talking about biased based policing, racial profiling, or profiling on any of the protected classes, I'm not here to convince you that it exists or it doesn't exist. But I am here to share with all of you how long these conversations have been happening in our community. Next. Unfortunately, some of these conversations have impacted different communities um, over the last 20 years as shame on you. And I think also this has prevented many times for this conversation to continue because this is not a new conversation and I'm happy that we're taking this conversation on and this is not the only community that is having this conversation, the entire United States is having this conversation. And unfortunately it ends in conversation because I don't see any specific actions being taken in order to mitigate it. When we're talking about biased based policing or racial profiling, next, it brings feelings, judgment, shame, blame, guilt, anger, confusion, and alienation. Next, combined, you know, and then communities feel that we are then placed on the other side combating misinformation, missing history, biased history, or stereotyping. 
Next. And I brought the two spirits of our elders, Dr. Proudfoot and Dwight Sowers, because Dwight Sowers on the Human Rights Commission for many, many years, and one of the things that he always said to me, we need to be able to understand multiple perspectives, and there has to be a balance in our conversations. Next. Therefore, we need to be able to connect through our humanity, and what does it feel like, what does it look like, and what does it sound like, and he always asked a question to when we were dealing with human rights issues and said, if this were true, if racial profiling, bias-based policing, if it was true, conscious or unconscious, intentional or unintentional, what would it mean for us as a community? That's a question that I'm just going to leave out there, and I'm going to end with that one. Next. So this conversation, I know for me, started back in 1992 to 2014. You can all call it a labyrinth, call it next. You can call it going in multiple ways, next. This is a timeline, you know, started with having conversations and taking some very specific actions with Chip Cook, Chip Jim Hill, Chip Leonard, Fab Buchanan, there was interim, and now with Chip Kearns. And in between that, um, I have to say that our current chief was absolutely involved in some of the amazing outreach that we did, and for that I'm thankful. Next. Some of the highlights of history that I actually went to the website and saw is what was important back then in order to create community relations. How is it that the information came forward? How is it that these issues were coming forward for us to be able to tackle them? Unfortunately, many of these things are no longer exist, and that's where, to me, for the city of Eugene, really needs to say what's important to us and where is it that we're putting our resources. So we had a community, Whitaker Community Center. Oh my God. The connections that it had, the multiple ways the community went and actually shared what was happening in the community, their perceptions, again, real or unreal, conscious or unconscious, intentional or unintentional, that were, the officers there were absolutely in tune with the community, and we had great conversation. Next, one second. Human Rights Commission, Community Policing, Outreach to Communities, Developing Community Relations, Developing Community Trust, Intentionality, Active Participation in Community Events, you know, the establishment of the Police Commission in 1998. Next. Next, please. Okay. That's a minute. <laughs> 1999, <laughs> Regional Academy. We had it here. We had community panels. We share experiences and opportunities. Conflict resolution, community advocate program. 2001, the hate crime conference that we all participated as a community to do, 600 participants. 2006, that's where the Police Auditors and Civilian Review Board happened. That happened because of community involvement. Let's be clear about that. 1998 to 2012, multiple community conversations and currently listening sessions. So this conversation is not new. We've had different ways of having this conversation. So we look at our files, we'll see our communities. Next, please, give me one more minute. Uh, just to wrap it up. So some of the best practices that I can share with you, Whitaker Community Center, sharing PD police officers, sharing multiple perspectives, community advocates, Human Rights Commission project, constant and consistent outreach to community, community observer network, EPD community connections, cafe with an officer that we use to sponsor. Next. Active participation in key community <coughs> events, multiple community entry points, so communities can come and put their concerns and complaints, not just one. Hate biases, collection protocols, community involvement in hiring and promotion panels. There was an active involvement in that. Best practices learned, social security policy development and outreach. Go back to see what we did back then around visits to local churches and others. Next. Key essential question again, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna end with how I started. If the stories of our neighbors are true, what would it mean for you? I can tell you from the perspective of where I'm sitting, there's a level of we're tired of telling our stories. And if our stories were true, what would it mean and what would it do? Next, I'm almost done. No blame, no shame. <coughs> if we go back to the shame and the blame, we're not gonna get anywhere. Next, bringing back our elders and their lessons. You know, if these were true, what would we do? And can we actually do it authentically to active actions? Thank you, Carmen. Next, uh, Ken, please. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to be on the panel this evening. 
I'm coming from the Human Rights Commission, so uh, what I want to do is look at the bias-based policing policy, uh, which is now a draft form, with a human rights lens. Um, the mandate of the Human Rights Commission is to encourage implementation of the principles and standards expressed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights across all city departments and across the larger community. And among these rights is the human right to equal treatment under the law and the human right to freedom from discrimination. The Universal Declaration is, is not a treaty. Uh, it's really a statement of aspirations. It's a statement of what we would like to see the world look like. But the United States has signed and ratified two important international human rights treaties which address these two rights that I, that I had mentioned here. Um, the United States has signed the Convention on Civil and Political Rights and the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And I want to focus on the second one, the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, or CERD, C-E-R-D, as it's often referred to. Um, and the reason I want to focus on CERD, um, not only besides the fact that because it's signed and ratified by the United States, all levels of government are responsible for following uh, its, its standards and principles, but because the standards are higher in this international treaty, then are the civil rights anti-discrimination laws to which the current policy that you've written is responding. And I think CERD and ideas in CERD can be used to strengthen the policy that you have. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. First of all, CERD requires that anti-discrimination efforts be proactive. That is, it requires that the state, in quotation marks, local government in this case, actively seek to uh, identify areas in which discrimination is taking place and address it. Um, conventionally in civil rights, um, the way civil rights are handled in this country, you have to wait for a complaint to come in and then you try to figure out whether um, it's justified and, and, and what you should do about it. From the CERB perspective, you go out and look for it. You look for the things that are happening to people because often they may not know quite what's happening to them or they may be afraid to come and complain and so forth. So proactivity. And I would suggest that that um, the committee works on wording into the policy, emphasizing that the EPD will be proactive in the search for discrimination, for evidence of discrimination. Second, urge CERD requires that not only intentional, but unintentional discrimination be addressed, since both have the same negative effects. Uh, and I'd suggest some wording in the policy that makes it clear that unintentional discrimination can occur that it is as harmful as intentional discrimination from the perspective of the person receiving it, um, and that it will be prohibited um, in the same manner as intentional discrimination. Third, CERB draws attention to the concept of disparate impact. Uh, we're in formal or informal decisions differentially affect group, group, different groups in negative ways. Again, whether this is intentionally or not. Now, I'll offer an example. I don't think it's necessarily the best example, and, uh, but it's an example I thought of this afternoon. If officers have a tendency to pull over older cars, because older cars tend to have a taillight out or a license plate out or something like that, does this mean they're most likely to pull over lower income people? And does it mean that they're more likely to pull, most likely to pull over um, people of color? who are disproportionately represented amongst low-income people. And so I think it's important when the data come in and the data are analyzed that the analysts look behind the surface of the data and try to figure out what, exactly what kinds of decisions are being made here uh, that lead to these kinds of outcomes. Um, and I think that would be very useful for training purposes um, for the officers. I like to think of police officers as human rights workers. They ideally do more than protect and serve, which I see on cars in different cities. Um, they should model respect for human rights. And I think this is one of the things that the Human Rights Commission would like to see EPD do. And we see plenty of evidence that um, 
that's understood and, and there's efforts being made in that direction. The principal concern I have with the policy uh, as written is the imprecision of the wording regarding who is being protected from biased policing. I see mention of protected classes as defined in the human rights ordinance. I see mention of other classes of people as well who are not considered protected classes under the ordinance. Um, how are these being determined? Um, how are they being defined? Is a question I have. What, what does the phrase, quote, or affiliation with any similar identifiable group, unquote, mean? Um, as, as a lay person reading the policy, I, it's, I'm mystified by it. Does economic status include people who are homeless or perceived to be homeless? Um, now, economic status is not one of the protected classes. Source of income is one of the protected classes. So this is something that you put in. And if economic status does include people who are homeless or perceived to be homeless, um, I think that should be clearly stated in the policy because that's a particularly important point in this community. Um, and the last thing I would like to say is uh, I didn't see any provision, or maybe I just missed it, a provision for reporting. Transparency is one of the important components of the human rights framework. And reporting out on what's found uh, I think would be very valuable, so working some language in there uh, that would uh, allow that. On behalf of the Human Rights Commission, uh, I'd like to thank the Police Commission and the EPD for working on this policy and the evidence it shows of your commitment to human rights. Thank you, Ken. Next, Raquel. Well, you guys are going to get tired of this. <laughs> All right, well, I have a little PowerPoint that I put together here. So, um, so I work with immigrants, and when asked to put something together, mm -hmm. thinking about the policy and looking at the policy, it strikes me that oh, what I'm going to advocate for in this policy is the use of discretion. I think that that might be the most important thing um, in police work that I, I do think exists, but I think also is really extra important in the immigration context. So go ahead. So I'm going to tell you the, my story about how I met Pete, our illustrious chief of police, and his excellent decision and positive discretion. Uh, so there is my new car. See, I drive Rolls, right, Pete? And it's not true, but it's uh, next, <laughs> a little better than my old car. Felt like a Rolls after I bought it. And I bought it on New Year's Eve. And, oh, uh, wait, don't, well, okay, we'll go there. And there's Pete stopping me, my new car, and New Year's Eve, and um, admiring my new car, in which I said, well, thank you, I just bought it. And he said, well, I can tell. And I said, how's that? And he said, you need to learn to, how to turn your lights on. And so <laughs> that is how I met Pete out at 2 in the morning on New Year's Eve, New Year's morning, <laughs> um, when we probably should have all been asleep. Uh, and then he then soon discovered that I also did not have my insurance with me. <laughs> and um, nonetheless made the discretionary decision that I was not worth hauling down to jail and spending the night down there. Since, as I told him, I'm probably the only person out here tonight who's not been drinking. And um, let me go. But now I'm going to tell you a story of a person who came in my office last week, because it's uh, someone I remember, um, who last year was stopped by Springfield police um, for speeding. So reasonable reason to stop him. And uh, let's call him Jose. So Jose has insurance, but he does not have a license. Through no fault of his own, he cannot get a license because he does not have legal status in the United States. And so, um, Jose, um, this, uh, so Jose was able to identify himself because he had insurance in his name, he had the registration for his car, but apparently that was not good enough he was arrested and taken to um, jail, and ICE was called, and now he is suffering the much more extreme consequence of having to face deportation 
uh, Jose is married and has, actually he lives with his, the mother of his three children and he's lived in this country for, um, well, since about 1999, so 15 years or so. Um, and, and so for, for this sort of offense, I'll go ahead and go to the next one. So the point I'm making here is that officers have discretion to issue citations to arrest. Um, they should look at the circumstances. It's really important. Uh, but the other point I would like to, before moving on to my discretionary point, I also think it's really important that we make some assumptions in looking at policy um, that I feel would be more productive. And that is that especially in the Eugene area, it's my belief that officers do receive adequate training on the issues of race. I, I do believe that officers are not intentionally racist. They certainly do not want to be called racist. And I don't think it's productive for us to have that conversation to keep calling each other racist. Or we can all just admit that we all have our prejudices. And just because you're stopped by an officer of a different race, or even you're stopped by an officer of the same race, I don't think that calling each other racist is a productive way to approach this policy. I, I think that if we could look at it in terms of discretion, circumstances, how to adequately train in terms of cultural sufficiency, you know, cultural differences, and what's going on in our community. Because with the immigration community, we're talking about a large amount of fear and because of these consequences. Go ahead. Uh, so that's my little, you know, I don't think that, you know, I think most people like their neighbors. They might have little differences. You know, our Asian and Canada neighbors might be, you know, look different. But for the most part, once we get to know each other, I think we can all agree that we like each other. Okay, go quickly now. <laughs> um, so it's one of fostering good relationships in a diverse community. I think we need to also, thanks to Tom Turner and Deschutes County, um, there is that manual that's sent around. We need to make assumptions about immigrants, that they belong here, they should be welcomed here, that all segments of our community have a role to play in fostering our welcoming, less threatening, intimidating atmosphere. That's what I'd like to see as the basis for this policy. Go ahead. Um, and that in order to make communities safe, immigrants need to know that law enforcement is a safe resource, and part of that would be not to disproportionately penalize for minor violations of the law. Go ahead. Um, consider the impact on immigrants if they're arrested and taken to jail. You know, the secure community programs means that for any low-level violations, you're likely to have the consequence of being papered for deportation. Go ahead. Um, and for things beyond your control. And why, you know, there's a lot of fear in there. You're going to get a lot worse criminal activity like hit and run people lying to you because they're afraid and it's not a good way to police. And next one. And you minimize trauma as a family because it is extremely traumatic. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Next, Emilia. <coughs> this is a moat, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Um, coming from the community aspect, most of my work has been around um, youth either up to attain their GED through the university's program or other programs across the uh, state. The history that Carmen and well everybody here has already discussed is so repetitive. The fear factor is crucial. We're back to that point now where parents are not allowing their kids to go to school because they're afraid of what's going to happen to them on their way there or on their way back or at school. There was a, a recent incident at one of our local schools where police officers stopped this uh, young man walking down, walking down the street who appeared to be doing something here that is not supposed to be happening, uh, expects its officers to make contact through observation. There was no observation. The observation was he was a Latino, dressed like most kids are now, he did find less than an ounce of marijuana on him, so he got ticketed for that. Sent him on his way back to school. The officer went back to the school the next day, ticketed him again. This went on for three times. He got ticketed three different times. 
The school counselors didn't know what to do. They contacted our the LULAC organization and other community leaders in regards to what this was all about. His parents didn't know what was going on. They didn't understand the law. Even the first ticket, they didn't understand. So there was no way for the parents to be involved in any of this. I don't see anything. I think Carmen addressed it, that the education in here to the community is crucial. Through that historical line that Carmen had drawn out, and I'll just address, language has never been really addressed for the police officers in the department. It says that there will be, if there is a language issue, someone will, will be sent there. But how's that going to happen? Meanwhile, if I get stopped for whatever reason and I don't speak English, how long do I have to sit there and wait with two cars, three cars, waiting police cars with their lights flashing, and I don't know anything that's going on? And when you're poor, as was addressed about the cars, that carries over into my whole experience, even working at the State Board, being on the State Board of Education, in the parking lot, in Salem, under the public service building, in my sports car, getting into it, and security people come up to me and ask me what I'm doing. I said, I'm leaving. Now, I could have told them that I was on the state board and all that, but why was I being asked what was I doing because I was unlocking an expensive sports car? You have to go through all these things. It doesn't matter from my days as a migrant worker when we were addressed as stay out, we don't want your business here. I was born during a period of time or lived through the period of time where I said no dogs or Mexicans allowed. That pretty much hasn't changed. The signs are gone, but in some of the parents' minds, we're still not welcome here. <coughs> I drive a BMW now, I have a Harley and a big truck. I have all these vehicles, all these toys I never had when I was poor. So granted, I have a lot of vehicles, but my point to that is when I see a police officer behind me, I know he's checking my license. He drives by, he figures it's clean, and he drives by and he looks in the car slowly, looking for what? That does not, for me, does not connect with the contact through observation thing in a positive way. Now that's my experience, but when I work with youth, we're not only talking about um, their age, what they're driving, what they look like. What we're coming to is there is no longer a community place for families or youth or anybody to go to to get some information or service. There used to be a police person, as Carmen had addressed. I'm not sure that person's in the Whitaker area any longer. We don't know how many people on the force, I don't anyway, don't know how many people on the force speak Spanish. And so that process is the discretion issue that Raquel addressed. The fear factors back into our community. When parents tell me that they're not gonna let their kids go to school anymore because they're afraid of what the police are gonna be doing or what the community's gonna be doing, we have lost all, you know, we're completely clear back to the 90s, actually the 80s when I was still here, or started here. This ongoing dialogue is, I agree totally with Raquel's issue about discretion, but the communication aspect of this policy is, I don't see anything different than what's going on. Contacts and observation, well, we all have different ways of looking at different people. And studies show that the first identifier that people use is race, race and gender. And that, that research has come from California. So that in and of itself has not changed around here. The training for police officers 
is head, I have a nephew that's a police officer in California, and he's told me that it's very clear that you need to watch out for Latinos that are either in expensive cars or poor cars, or are overdressed, <coughs> or just hanging out. So training, I don't think, is the way to go without community involvement in how that is carried out. Thank you. Thank you, Major. Next is Jed. <coughs> Hello to the Police Commission um, and fellow panel, panel members. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I am a, one of the elected representatives for the Eugene Police Employees Association. Our association represents about 230 members of the Eugene Police Department, uh, 911 Call Center, and um, the Records Division at Eugene Police Department. In, uh, in our, our union, we have a variety of officers from probably every conceivable background within their families and extended families, as you can imagine. They're, um, <coughs> they live in this community. They uh, share a lot of their experiences. A lot of their family members have also shared the experiences that um, uh, having contact with police officers. Um, not all of them are great. Some of them are most are positive. Um, and I think as a union, our, our goal is to assist the commission in developing policy as best we can so that we can come up with a policy that best fits our community and that is a workable policy so that officers um, can do their job effectively and efficiently. Um, we're very um, in favor of having an open discussion about anything. So at any time in the future, um, would be happy to come and assist anyone in this panel or commi uh, commission with discussing any other um, policy. Um, I think that as it was written in the, um, the opener for the uh, pur uh, purpose and scope of this policy, I think, where it says uh, unequivocally that bias-based profiling by the Gene Police Department will not be tolerated. I think this is, uh, this is very important because it is morally and ethically um, morally and ethically uh, inappropriate to conduct policing based on a preconceived bias. We feel that um, aside from the ethical and moral issues that this is an, an ineffective way of conducting the policing. Our large goal throughout the department and as a union is to lower the crime rate within the city of Eugene and make our streets safer for everybody. Uh, includes all uh, dimensions of society. Um, I think there are things we can do to better improve our sta uh, status and, and uh, get our message out to the community. I think that if we were able to take a little bit more time in, on each contact and explain why we did what we did, I think this would greatly help how we are perceived within the community. And people would also have a better understanding of why Let's say I did. I pulled somebody over for a reason X, Y, Z. Why I decided to stop someone riding a bicycle. Um, I think that's how we can improve. I. This is something that I also can improve. Sometimes I tend to like to do a lot of policing. I like to go out and make a lot of arrests, write a lot of tickets sometimes, and I think that with my large goal of high activity and high volumes, I think that sometimes I spend a little less time on each contact. I think it's very, uh, it, would be an, it would be a greater benefit for me as an officer to convey my department's message that um, we do care. As a, it says on our, uh, in our model for it, text serve care. I think care does uh, have its role in that and I do want to convey that I do care, as do our members in the union. Um, so I do look forward to any other future discussions you have, and I would be happy to take part in anything you throw my way. Thank you. Thank you, Jed. Next is Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to present um, in five minutes or less. So. What I need to be today is, um, uh, I need to check my personal feelings 
and uh, be mechanical in terms of um, my view of what this policy ought to look like. Um, uh, first and foremost, um, I had hoped uh, that there would be more depth in the policy. Um, uh, what I see in the policy is um, uh, it tells officers what they can't do. But it doesn't give them the parameters about what they can do. What are the parameters of a Terry stop? Uh, what are the parameters of a voluntary contact? Uh, what are the parameters of a social contact? Uh, what are the parameters of a non-custodial interviews? Uh, I wasn't going to use my visual aid, but I will. Uh, probably none of you know that I um, umpire softball games. And once or twice a year, uh, I'm confused about a call I make. It's rather innocuous, so I usually don't hear about it. But what do I do? I come home and I look it up in the rule book to see if I got it right or not. This policy needs to be like a rule book. It needs to explain what a Terry stop is. It needs to explain what all these stops are so that if I'm a little bit confused, I can come back myself uh, uh, and be a conscientious employee and look it up and talk about it with my colleagues. And uh, we will be told that they're trained on these issues. But uh, we all know, uh, we all absorb different things when someone is talking to us just like this evening. So from a mechanical standpoint, um, uh, I um, expect in the policy that it will explain the different stops officers may make and how voluntary and non-voluntary stops differ. Um, describes what officers may and may not do during non-voluntary stops. Explains that officers must identify themselves and tell the person why they are being detained if it's a non-voluntary stop and hold them only as long as necessary. Explains when an officer may frisk or pat down a detained person for weapons and requires officers to report all non voluntary stops for review and to detect patterns of discrimination, which is what uh, uh, tips things are. Um, it must explain that officers must not act in a way which would cause a reasonable person to believe they were obliged to answer the officer's questions or follow other directions by the officer in a voluntary contact. And so um, for me, uh, I've also had discussions about implicit uh, bias. And I know that that's an important issue uh, for some of the folks uh, that um, I've had these discussions with. I'm not sure that we can really legislate the elimination of implicit bias. Uh, implicit bias diminishes when you experience other people uh, when you learn through education and training the experiences and perceptions of other people when you interact with people who are different than you uh, I and I'll refer to a, a um, the Kerwin incident Institute K-I-R-W-A-N uh, it's at the real OSU the Ohio State University, <laughs> and um, they do a significant amount of study on both um, explicit and implicit bias, and um, just a tremendous resource for better understanding that in terms of uh, training and teaching and education. And so um, uh, I encourage you to check that out. Uh, I want to um, uh, commend the folks who are doing the data collection project only about 15% of police departments in the nation collect data for the purposes of determining whether or not they are um, biased in their policing methods. And so I do commend the group working on that. Um, Carmen, I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll make real strides in this matter. I'm also encouraged, I think it was today or yesterday, that the Philadelphia Police Department is revisiting how they interact with ICE and are um, and I think that they have come up with a method that is not going to uh, 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 risk uh, federal intervention if they don't follow some of the things that they've always considered requirements. 
And so I, I appreciate the hard work on the policy, um, but to me, a policy manual, uh, especially for some of those important as this, um, needs to have more depth. And now I'll just go for a personal opinion, 30 seconds. Um, speaking, um, uh, listening to the other speakers, and I've said this uh, for years, is that people who fear the police the most need the police the most. And um, for me, it's like what needs to be done for people to feel safe, not just as a crime victim, but as a contact. There's not one of us in this room that, that if you've seen those lights behind you, that you have some concern about what may happen to you personally that goes beyond the requirements of what a law enforcement officer is supposed to do. So we need to work to reduce that fear in all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Last but not least, Kip. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Juan Carlos. And, and uh, thank you, commissioners, to uh, invite for the invitation to discuss my piece of this, which is a bit more narrow than the other speakers. Um, I'm not going to make comments or give you opinions on larger policy considerations, um, partly because my piece of this is, is narrow and more distinct. Uh, and the other is I still work as a judge from time to time, and I can't do that. I can't give you opinions. And it's, a, it's a, one of the nicest parts of being a judge. I can't do that, and I can't sign a petition. So everybody that comes to the door gets turned around and uh, sent away. Um, <clears throat> I was drafted by uh, Chief Kearns to co-chair the Stops Data uh, Committee that uh, has looked at the information, the data that, uh, uh, to make recommendations on the data to be collected um, by police officers uh, doing tra conducting traffic stops. Uh, this was part of the purchase of a new software system. Uh, this committee uh, met, and we met from between November and, and currently our work will continue, uh, but we have forwarded recommendations to Chief Kearns, which uh, the department has then used to develop those data points that are going to be collected by um, officers on the street. I think the makeup of the committee is important, um, so let me quickly indicate or tell you who's on, who is on this committee. Uh, Captain Cam Carr and myself, and we're non-voting members of the committee. Um, officers Jed McGuire, who's here, and Greg McManus from EPD. Joan Quimps, who's an EPD records and data manager. Mark is on the committee. Yvette Alex Asimel, uh, who is vice president for equity and inclusion at the University of Oregon. Michael Kerrigan, Community Alliance of Wayne County. Dave Fedenke, uh, <coughs> executive director of the ACLU for Oregon. Edward Olivos, associate professor and department head uh, for education studies at the U of O. Jim Garcia, Chicano, Latino program uh, coordinator at LCC, Jane Waite, Equity and Diversity Specialist, Lane ESD, Linda Hamilton, Correction, Correction Counselor for Lane County Parole and Probation, Eric Richardson, Executive Director of the NAACP for Eugene, Springfield and Lane County, and Remy Kalalong, who is a Multicultural and Equity Coordinator for the Beth School District. Our task was to uh, make recommendations as to what specific data police officers should collect when they're conducting traffic stops. So that data could be collected, it can be archived, it can be examined, it can be analyzed, and it can be a uh, basis for policy policy creation and policy implementation. Um, we were under a relatively short timeline because of the purchase of this system, but we had, um, <clears throat> as a guide, recommendations both from the State of Oregon through the Law Enforcement Contact Policy and Data Review Committee, which has made recommendations as to what data points police officers should um, be gathering so that this information can be analyzed, and also the United States Department of Justice. We looked at this, we considered it, uh, we had discussions um, over a period of time, and we arrived uh, by consensus at the data collection points that then were forwarded to Chief Kearns. Uh, the process uh, involved um, not only the group discussion, but presentations as to um, data that could be collected, uh, we had a presentation from EPD officers on what a traffic stop looks like. So we had some idea of what the work impact uh, would be for EPD because there are conflicting uh, interests here. Uh, certainly there's the need to collect 
complete, comprehensive and accurate information. There's also the need to make sure that police officers are not overburdened by uh, one piece of their work uh, to the exclusion of other pieces. And so we have completed that. Our work will continue until November of 2015 as we begin to collect, or EPD begins to collect data um, on, through a pilot program. And we are discussing how the data is to be analyzed and what periods of time we'll have enough data so that it's useful of what we can do with that. What I can tell you is that the data points we selected were more inclusive. We expanded on what was recommended both by the Law Enforcement Contacts Policy and Data Review Committee from the State of Oregon and the Federal Department of Justice. And uh, we think that that is going to allow, um, the, allow EPD to be able to drill deeper into some of the questions that this data may be able to uh, shed some light on, or at least raise different questions that uh, we might not otherwise have been aware of. Uh, so that is what we have done. It is a piece of, it's a distinct piece of the larger questions that um, have been discussed tonight, and you as a commission will be discussing. And there I am, under budget. <laughs> Thank you, panelists, for this on, this on, show this on. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Okay, thank you, panelists, for your time. Commissioners, if you look at each of the panelists, they bring a lot of years of experience. They bring with them a lot of experiences that obviously, and not only that they have witnessed, they experienced. They work with many, many families that, that have been affected. I believe this is a gift. I also believe that we need to do a lot of things, and hopefully you were listening to every single word that they said. May I remind you that, uh, in audience members, that the next uh, meeting of this kind will be uh, a public forum, which is on April, April the 3rd, here at Harris Hall, and I believe it's at 5.30. Audience members, if you have any questions, and they may not be asked today, you have an opportunity to ask that question. April 3rd here. I am now going to open the floor to commissioners for questions. Uh, please keep, keep it one question for this round. And panelists, if you, if you have to get a question that's directed at you and you, there's another one that wants to jump in and add to it, please get my attention to and be recognized so I can put you on the queue. Commissioners? Okay. Not everybody at the same time. Yeah, really. <laughs> so I think I have Joe. Is that is it Joe or John? Sorry. Go ahead. I just, <coughs> first of all, name for George Rody. First of all, I wanted to thank you for enlightening us on the many, many different facets of uh, of the problem of uh, profiling. <coughs> uh, it, and I must say, this brings up, every time I hear things like this, it brings up more and more confusion because it is a very, very, very confusing, deep, faceted field. It also brings up fear. <laughs> I've been kind of fearing that as myself, as a white Anglo-Saxon male, that it brings up fear even saying things because uh, I am, well, as of now, a majority, I don't know how much longer, which is an another whole thing. It, it doesn't bother me. I have traveled quite a bit. I have been minorities uh, in other countries, but then again, I'm a white American, so I, you know, I, I, I get very, very confused at that. Uh, I don't know whether there is an answer. Some of the great questions that you bring up of such as the poor people having tail lights out or, or the uh, unfortunate legislation of, or as of my opinion of the unfortunate legislation of uh, uh, some of the people not having uh, driver's licenses is an unfortunate situation and would bring me a great deal of fear if I was in that. I don't have any answers uh, to any of this, uh, just more questions and keeping in mind, we, we talked a little about, for instance, the driver's licenses or, and I'll just use this, the thing about taillights, if they're out, it is, the police are just giving policies and guidelines to to follow and 
it would seem to me that if you look your, and I'm just going to use the driver's license one uh, that you brought up, that then you would need to do that all across the race line and therefore pretty soon you should not have driver's licenses at all because if you look one way for one minority or majority, you have to look at that to be fair all the way across. Just another something else that makes it more complicated. Commissioner Rutter, do you have any questions for the panelists? Uh, yeah, for, uh, and I'm, come on. <laughs> okay. What do you do about situations like that? Well, I, there are a couple of things there because I have been advocating this issue, um, and and it is a difficult one. And I agree completely that the dis the the treat disparate treatment of different groups is definitely something that needs to be discussed greater. But what does frequently happen is the person doesn't have a driver's license, but they have insurance and registration, all these other things. And so, they, and, and they have no other criminal record. So, you know, but for the driver's license, you can really make an assumption, and this is where my argument about discretion comes in. You can make this assumption, I have a pretty loud voice, so I'm not sure I need this. It um, helps. That they would have a driver's license if they could. And, you know, so that's where it becomes a discretionary question, whether, you know, and maybe it's not a policy. I think it should be something that should be discussed, though, because there are all these other factors that could be considered. Thank you. Thank uh, and wait, let me just make one last point about that, and that is that although it's a really big fine and it's a really heavy duty fine for a lot of immigrants, and so I'm not advocating that we fine them, but at the very least, I am advocating that knowing full well that these people are likely to come into immigration and custody if they are arrested, I would advocate that if you are having trouble identifying them, that perhaps a policy in which you, you know, allow them to call, you know, detain them temporarily at that place, allow them to call somebody in the family to bring over some form of identification or use in its place their insurance or their registration, as opposed to having them hit the jail. If they're checked into the jail, ICE will likely see them, and then the consequences are so much greater. Thank you. Next, uh, Joe Tindo. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I found a lot of very interesting points in, in a lot of the presentations by the speaker. Um, in particular, Mark, you hit on a thing that's, uh, you know, an issue for me, is we've, we've looked at three levels of a stop, an encounter, a stop, and an arrest. And I think we have an issue of what is the difference between an encounter and a stop. In other words, at what point is the stop not voluntary, and how long do you actually get to detain the person before um, it becomes a stop as opposed to an encounter. And so I guess the, you know, if you could talk a little bit further on that issue, that would be great. Um, and then the second thing uh, that folks brought up, several, several folks on the panel, is the issue of economic status. Um, in some ways, uh, being poor seems to be the new black. And, uh, you know, that you know, does being poor trigger something that sort of allows a fishing expedition? So in other words, if you stop someone because they look poor, do you eventually find something that you can get them for? Um, and that was an experience that I, you know, saw during my time, you know, dealing with a lot of the homeless folks as a result of Occupy, where people were being stopped and um, you know, eventually in the encounter, something would be fine, found to nuke them for. So were they doing anything that deserved being nuked at the original stop? Probably not, but it did allow that kind of, of a result. So my first question is to Mark about, uh, you know, how, how should we go about, what are your suggestions for defining when an encounter turns into a stop? And, uh, and then for anyone on the panel about the issue of is being poor the new black. Mark? Uh, thank you. Uh, you pass the microphone. The microphone is the last capture on, on audio video. Yeah. Um, okay. 
the depth of your question uh, limits my ability to answer it fully, but it needs those need to be defined in the policy, um, and um, I can define them as a social contact. A voluntary consensual encounter uh, between police and a person, um, a non-custodial interview, uh, again, which is a vol voluntary and consensual investigatory interview, uh, neither of which is a seizure. I think that the in those two contexts, uh, there's a factor in the minds of many that. They are not free to go. And so, uh, to me, then, the policy uh, needs to include those words that I included before, which uh, um, is that officers must not use any words, actions, demeanor, or other show of authority that would tend to communicate that a person is not free to go. Um, the courts have not required officers in um, social contexts uh, to say that they're free to go. But by the same token, I think uh, in the best interest of the community, and uh, argu arguably perhaps not in the best interest of getting arrest numbers, is any show of intimidation or uh, being compelled to stay um, should not exist. Uh, I know that uh, on the chance uh, that I may be stopped, I would ask immediately, am I free to go? So that it's established very clearly. Um, so, and then um, you go into that next level of the Terry stop, which is a reasonable suspicion stop. And again, um, uh, my philosophy about that in terms of policy is uh, it ought to be in the policy manual. Um, others think that um, it needs to be more generic because the law changes often and things like that. But again, um, um, when the law changes, then we have a responsibility to ensure that that is conveyed to the officers in some sort of policy appendix or uh, uh, something along those lines. Um, and then, uh, because uh, in the it's not clearly defined in EP policy, and I appreciate that it is trained. Uh, a Terry stop is a detention short of arrest, but officers, uh, if they believe that they have reasonable suspicion that a person is engaged in criminal activity or is about to engage in criminal activity, they are entitled to uh, detain them for a period of time to determine whether or not there is probable cause that a crime has occurred. Um, and so, uh, to me, in terms of policy, um, it would be, if I was an officer, uh, uh, it would be of value to me to have that in my policy and procedure manual. And not having it as a quick reference, um, I think, would uh, negatively impact my ability to do my job. And also, um, it, it's a reinforcement tool in terms of keeping up to date. When you get your if you go to college and you get your textbook and maybe you read the whole textbook in the first week to think that you're never going to use that as a reference tool throughout that class or your career or whatever, I think then it has um, um, to some degree failed as a tool for a person who has a career in law enforcement if it's not regularly referenced. And the only way to me that it would be regularly referenced is if it had valuable information that was important to me. And that includes detail. But again, some folks don't feel that. So I, I, and I appreciate that perspective as well. Thank you, Mark. Uh, panelists, the second question was about economic status. Any of you would like to expand or comment on that? Ken? While the microphone is coming, audience members, you have the opportunity to. Your microphone is to, not working half the time. It's not working. You have to wiggle, wiggle the wire. It's not how you're holding it. It's not. Uh, so hold it in the position where it works. Yeah. Wow. You want it works in your left hand. But Here I am. Right. <laughs> audience members, you have the opportunity to write. It's not a political question. comment, is it, brother? And that's not being forward. Uh, Cora, do you have any questions from the audience? Okay. <coughs> 
All right, so I want to make sure that you understand you can ask a question and I will get, I'll get to it in a minute. Ken, please. Uh, the question, as I understood when you were asking this, uh, are poor people, are people who are poor, uh, the new blacks. And I think that um, for generations and generations, uh, going all the way back to, uh, to England, uh, poor people have been considered to have a different uh, culture than uh, people who are non-poor, non different values. So that, for example, it's, it's asserted that poor people are poor because they don't like to work. Or poor people have uh, children out of wedlock because they don't believe in the institution of marriage. Or poor people are being picked up for crimes because they don't really have respect uh, for law and so forth. And um, that certainly carries over into the treatment of people who are homeless, uh, even in our own community. Uh, if you ever sit and, and, and read some of the comments about homeless people at the end of articles um, that appear uh, in the Register Guard or um, the um, news stories on KZI or uh, KVAL um, and the comments that people are, being, are making about uh, setting up an opportunity village or a rest stop and things like that. You would be literally physically sickened to see the kinds of attitudes that people, uh, that people have. There's a widespread belief in this, in this society in the concept of what sociologists call competitive individualism. And that's the notion that anybody can make it if they really try. And there's all kinds of evidence that that is not true. And but if you're seen as poor, you're seen as somebody who's not trying. And, and the implication is all, there's all kinds of levels of failure, from moral failure to cultural failure to uh, basic laziness, even some people are sort of genetic inferiority. So uh, this is not new, I don't think. Anybody else? Judge Kip? Can I Can I make uh, just uh, a comment to the, the issue about uh, adding definitions to a policy statement about uh, stops and counters, things like that. Um, I would suggest that uh, that be done carefully if there is if, if there is an effort to do that because they have there are specific legal definitions that apply. And as Mark said, there's a bit of bit of a, uh, there's a fluid nature to those, and you can't enter into some sort of um, interchange between two people and define it from the outset and say, okay, I'm going to have contact with you now and it's going to be a, a Terry stop. Um, the nature of that interchange is going to be subject to definition as is reviewed by the court. So um, trying to craft a policy that uses words such as those and, and adding definitions to those um, would be a little bit risky because um, there already are specific definitions to those um, that uh, case law has, has articulated, and then those change. So it's not to say that the idea behind it is not important, it's just I think you need to be a little cautious in, in how a policy, how specific a policy uh, uh, may be stated. Let's bring the microphone back to this end. Uh, Carmen is going to comment on that. Just a quick comment. Just, just a quick comment. Uh, uh, the chief, in fact, uh, I think uh, he was busy this, this evening, but he made time to come and join us. And I want to say thank you for making the time. Carmen? So I just, I just want to, uh, I'm sensitive to language. And being sensitive to language, also the positionality. So to me, uh, framing it as the new black, you know, what comes to mind is kind of an oppression Olympics. And this is not that, <laughs> because it is what is. I think that we hear in the research, you know, driving well black, driving well Latino. And so to me, that, that's just a very uncomfortable term, naming it as the new black. It is what it is. You know, these are profiling on basis of protected classes. And so that's, I just wanted to, to reference that. Can we let you jump in on that one? No, I want to go back to what Ken was saying about how England is viewed. It, it's when, it's when a young person is stigmatized in the school system already, and we read about it all the time, they don't show up to school, the teachers don't ask why, truancy officers don't ask until it's too late, 
that stigmatism and that anger that that child is carrying goes out onto the streets. And so when they encounter an officer who is not sensitive to where that child may be coming from, that just creates a whole other baggage that this student is going to carry, this young person is going to carry, either back to the school or in their life in general. The, the problem I have with all of that as an educator is that we don't see the police in the schools other than policing. I know that Pete goes in the, at times and talks, but we need to have officers in those schools talking to the students in a positive way and not there just to police. Because you talk to these young folks and they're going to say, don't go around the corner because the cop's there. And that student may have to have something that they want to talk to that officer about, but are afraid to. So I, I think that the police involvement in the educational system, in those buildings, is crucial if we're going to build on this I mean, citizen contact through observation. Hmm. I don't like that verbiage either. I'm not sure what observation means. That makes me look like I'm being checked out right now. Where's my car? What's he doing here? But I think that full involvement from the whole community, we have lost it totally. And by that I mean schools, police officers, our leaders, our judges, talking to the schools on a regular basis, not just when something needs to be dealt with. Thank you, I'm going to have next in the queue Bob Walker, followed by Mike. Thank you. Uh, I think George kind of stepped right into my question, so <laughs> you handled it very well. Thank you, Raquel. But I have a, a, a question for some people may not understand the full impact of this law. I, mm -hmm. I don't... Uh, can't hear you. Okay, sorry. Some Is this people may not, Oh, thank you. No, I think that's a recorder. Yeah, it's all right. Um, some people may not understand the full impact of what um, this law in Oregon it does to people who don't have citizenship status and don't have paperwork to prove who they are. So perhaps you could uh, tell us about that and talk about what uh, types of uh, works are in the background to try to fix this problem with uh, people b not being able to get licensed. Are you asking Raquel? Yes. Okay. Uh, you mean the license law or the, uh, the secure community? What, 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 the, uh, what the law is, the status of the law is right now in Oregon and whether there's uh, any licenses? change is proposed to so currently the uh, people not in specific documented status are, are ineligible to receive a license um and the legislature did pass a law allowing it it was supposed to be back in january but then there was an initiative to take it off um to allow it to go to the ballot so that won't happen until november so we'll be on the ballot we will be voting on it um and hopefully it will come back because I think it's important. But, uh, I mean, and the way these dovetail together in terms of, in the meantime, what the federal government has done is implement a secure communities initiative, um, which basically changes the way we find people who are not in lawful status by sweeping the <coughs> Um, which personally I think is a good idea. I've always said if you're going to be, you know, looking for people not, in the, you, know, you should not be going to people's workplaces like they were before, and you shouldn't be going to people's apartment buildings and terrorizing their children like we were doing in the 90s, if you all remember. That was just horrible. Um, and if you really are intent on deporting 12 million people, then I suppose the best way you should find them would be through the jails. But. Um, but what's happened is that because they have now put this really effective program into place, it's not just sweeping the people who we would all like to see deported, it's also catching the people who might hit the jails for very minor reasons. Um, and that's where, you know, we have this, where the two things connect and the issue comes up. Hmm. Thank you. We have Mike, followed by Edward. Thanks, sir. Thank all of you for being here today and tonight. 
uh, we appreciate very much your taking the time and your willingness to share your, your experiences and your wisdom. It's going to help us do a better job in crafting policy to, as, a, as a recommendation to the chief, and it'll certainly do a better job of helping our community if we have a more well thought out policy. I'm hearing a kind of a, an undertone of dynamic tension at the table that I'm, I want to draw out a little bit and I want to have a couple of you speak to. I'm hearing um, Mark in some instances and, and Ken in other for different reasons talking about the value of a more robust policy and a more detailed policy. Um, and I'm, I'm hearing Raquel talk about greater discretion. And so, for me, there's kind of a dynamic tension there, and I want to make sure we get this right. So I'm, I'm hearing the, the need for greater um, detail and a more robust policy around what? Keeping the officers from, from mistakes or helping to constrain them from, in decision making? I, I want to understand the request and the, and the recommendation there. And then the discretion part, I, I want to understand that a little bit better. Is that to, to avoid enforcing the laws that exists or, I, I mean, help me understand that dynamic tension and where the best policy lives. Mike, do you want anybody specifically that you would like to engage? Well, I just mentioned the three of them, but anybody that wants to jump well, in I on that. I, I, think. Um, I, I don't think there's a conflict because I think that specific detailing of you know, these stops and what the policies are, I think it's a very important and excellent idea. Um, in terms of the idea around discretion, I mean, obviously anything has to be within the bounds of law. Um, and I don't think, we all agree that there are certain lawful, there are ways to stop people and you know, what's allowed and what's not. Um, but for example, I have had many clients in Roseburg, most most likely when you're talking about Oregon, um, for, where officers just walk up to people and say, are you in legal status? Um, you know, and detain them if they say no, or stop people and ask them, what's your legal status? Um, that have no other reason for the stop. I mean, you know, all these things, obviously, first you need to read the policy manual so you know what, the, <laughs> what you're allowed to do, and then, there's the whole matter of discretion on what you should do, uh, given uh, the situation, given the circumstances. And there may be some discretion that you might not otherwise do, given the whole immigration situation. I think that's where I'm going with that. Thank you, Raquel. Ken and, and Mark, if you want to jump in. Yeah, I don't really see the, uh, a conflict going on here. I think what I was trying to express are some general principles uh, such as being proactive rather than sitting around waiting for complaints to come in, um, making sure that um, there's some way to understand that uh, discrimination can be inadvertent or, or unintentional, uh, but yet has the same kinds of negative effects on people. So part of the proactivity would be involved in uh, identifying where some of this unintentional uh, activity is going on, which is leading to these, these kinds of results. Um, so I don't think I'm narrowing um, or expanding anything. I think I'm just setting forth some principles that often people don't think about because they're not embracing the human rights framework. And Mark, you, you want to expand on the robust uh, things that you were talking about earlier? Uh, throughout this uh, session this evening, I, I try to keep my bureaucrat hat on <laughs> um, and not weave in my personal opinions. Um, there's a foundation for the recommendations uh, that I make, um, and that's um, studying both um, voluntary and imposed uh, policies on cities throughout the nation, on different uh, police policies. Um, most uh, those imposed um, uh, in every situation um, virtually coming from what uh, the Department of Justice imposes on some communities uh, in consent decrees and uh, certainly coming from Cincinnati, we were one of the first. Um, so um, 
I have an appreciation for uh, the power that they wield uh, when they decide to put you in their crosshairs. And so uh, my policy recommendations are primarily based on that foundation to wit that which is acceptable to the Department of Justice and most federal judges. Um, so uh, I'll, um, to some degree, respectfully um, uh, disagree with uh, Kip in, in that I think that being more specific is a um, safeguard from a bureaucratic standpoint. Uh, I've always, uh, I think since I've been here, I've said to the chief is um, if, if I give you a policy uh, recommendation and you accept it, I will own it 100%. Uh, I, I, uh, I don't make those recommendations cavalierly by the same token. Um, I really don't give a darn what their diplomatic immunity policy looks like. Now, there's about five, uh, five or six major areas that I'm concerned about, uh, including search, seizure, and uh, seizures of people, uh, force, uh, deadly force. Uh, uh, the other stuff really um, uh, doesn't matter. And so when I come forward with something like that, it's based on a pretty solid foundation of, of what I would personally want to have as an employee and what I would expect is, is both taught and documented and, and making it easier. Um, by the same token, make no mistake about it, for every action there's an equal reaction. Um, um, if the data that we collect becomes time consuming, um, that there will be a dip in production in terms of arrests. Uh, there will be a dip in um, citations. Um, uh, there will be, as a result of a dip in citations, a dip in revenue. Um, uh, one of the greatest dissatisfactions or complaints that we receive in, as an office is um, response time and not doing a CSI investigation <laughs> on a bike theft. And so yeah. um, uh, they are already resource stressed, uh, stressed and so uh, um, part of the perspective, I hope, of what comes out of that data committee is that it is nimble and quick so that officers continue to do the job that people in the community expect them to do. So all those things I think together create a dynamic of hopefully building uh, uh, community trust which is a pretty steep hill to climb. I know the conversation that the Chief and I had about the policy and the data study is we're, we're not sure where um, um, disparity exists. We, we hear people tell about personal experiences, but um, because of the way the law is written, unless you can document and identify where those disparities exist and come up with solutions, then we just continue to hear uh, individual stories from the community, uh, individual experiences from the community um, without trying to develop a patterns and finding patterns about where that um, may exist uh, and so again a lot of this is, is, is based on a pretty solid foundation of, of what DOG, DOJ throughout the country and federal courts uh, expect <coughs> by the same token none of this is required in the vast majority of the country and the fact that Eugene is one of 15% of all police, 28,000 police agencies in this nation that's doing that is a good thing. And hopefully we'll be able to identify trends and correct those trends. Thank you, Mark. Let's go ahead and end today's the queue. Have next uh, Edward Guerin, followed by Jim Gardner. Edward? Um, Councilmember Clark stole my nice speech thanking all of you, so let me just say what he said <laughs> over again. Thank you for being here. And to the audience as well, I appreciate you taking the time to um, further educate us up here. I just want to acknowledge some facts that I heard and then ask a question. Um, I heard about language barriers, and I know that I have lived in larger cities where hundreds of languages are spoken. There's not a possibility that it would all be covered by officers on the force. So you can't get somebody on the, on the radio to translate for you. And how some of those cities have dealt with that is through a telephone translation service under contract. I don't know if that still exists or whether that's something mm -hmm. the Jean's looked at, but it, it does 
provide a service for those language groups in a community that couldn't possibly hope to afford to train officers in those small language groups. So that's something we might want to look at if we're seeing a continual language barrier that it's not something as simple as English to Spanish. Um, but thank you for bringing that up again because as this community becomes more diverse through new arrivals and immigration, that's a problem that will continue to perhaps expand. I want to acknowledge the tremendous difference in outcome that it is for someone who has not got legal status here, doesn't have a driver's license, and sees the blue lights behind them. White, middle class, male, U.S. citizen has a very different outcome if they suddenly realize they don't have their insurance paperwork in the car. They're not likely to floor it and flee over that. And I think that as our work goes forward, we need to be really careful that we're not setting up situations that will actually put members of the public in danger because the consequences of these simple, simple stops can be so different for different parts of the community. So thank you for bringing that up. As far as the, how deep this policy should be and how precise, we don't want a situation in which everything that is not forbidden is compulsory, that there is no wiggle room, that there's no room for the officer to say, you know, you don't seem like a menace to society today. You seem like a guy who didn't know your taillight was out. And to be able to take an action based on that assessment and not something that says, if the taillight's out, you write them a ticket and it'll be for this much, period. So we need to be careful when we get very precise in our policy that we're not forcing officers into a decision that is too rigid and actually makes more problems than it solves. I love you have any questions for the panelists. I do. Get into that one right now. Um, Officer McGuire, you mentioned the pressure, perhaps, to have a lot of arrests and write a lot of tickets because that looked good in statistics. The taxpayers like to know that they're getting their money's worth in <coughs> patrol. What would be a different standard of success for officers sure, that and wouldn't push go just ahead. numbers? Go ahead. I'm sorry, what was that last part again? Say, instead of just pushing numbers, yeah. which as you say, leads to interactions that are mechanical and the citizen's not too happy with because you just moved on to the next one. What would be a different standard, different goal for you to go to than no stats? Sure. Um, I, I think when I refer to myself in that situation, what I was referring to is my desire to arrest DUI drivers. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time, the majority of my career, focusing arresting drunk drivers. Thank you. Now, thank you. In, uh, in that instance, I think numbers are the, mm -hmm. the more drunks, drunk drivers, and toxic drivers I can get off the road, the safer it is for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Now, I think in instances where I were to go to someone's house and uh, take a burglary report. Mm -hmm. In that instance, I think that would be quality over quantity. Mm -hmm. So if I spend an extra five minutes explaining to the person, hey, uh, you know, I see you have these big hedges out front of your house. They kind of hide your front door. Mm -hmm. Someone could go up to your door, knock, see you're not there, kick in the door, break an adjacent window, whatever, and come in. And I think that if I were to spend that time, that would be a much better um, use of that time in that instance. Um, and I think that if we were to, as an example also, that if I were to go to a, uh, a dynamic incident of some sort, um, uh, you know, Godzilla is climbing the Yapoa Terrace, okay, and there's, we're <laughs> focusing on trying to get Godzilla out, we've got this, you know, this huge perimeter around there, and someone comes up, officer, officer, what's going on? I said, just get back, get back, you gotta go. And I tell them to just go away. Because they need to get away, this guy chills on the terrace. And then, versus, hey, you know, sir, ma'am, um, this is a really serious situation here. Godzilla's climbing the tower. We're just trying to take care of this. If you could do me a favor and help me and explain to the other people around here that there's something going on that we're concerned about their safety, we'd like them to just stay away. Okay, great. I think that would be another way to um, assist and you know, improve our numbers mm -hmm. and quantity, or quality, excuse me. Can you think of any way to quantify or measure that kind of result? Because it's easy to say, this guy took this many drunk drivers off the road in a month. Is it 
the absence of citizen complaints is the only thing we have right now? I, just a thought. How do we measure that other standard of success? For the, the, the drunk drivers? Or well, the, no, the, 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 the not so tidy yeah. <laughs> interactions. How's that? You don't have to come up with the answer today. Yeah, I just, I, if you have I'll a just suggestion. a couple. Some might be that uh, um, citizen you know, quality surveys. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you ask, you know, if I have a contact with somebody mm -hmm. um, and let's say I happen to get their name, then we could send them a survey um, and say, hey, what did you think this officer did? How do you think he did? Um, you could do a, uh, a general you know, mail out survey to the greater public and say, mm -hmm. Send a hundred surveys out, whatever, and uh, see who, you know, how people are feeling on that contact. Um, follow up with people after a uh, burglary report and so forth, and say, hey, how did the officer do in that situation? I want to get to the next uh, two people. The last two people on the queue, and I want to be able to to read at least one question right from the audience. Jim Gardner, followed by Tamara. Well, I want to thank Mike for being so eloquent and is thanking the. Uh, the um, panels. our panelists here and and thank the people in the audience also um, I kind of want to go back to the, uh, to the to the stops issue and putting it, the definitions into policy I know in our at least our last meeting if not more than that it was pretty clearly stated that the officers very clearly knew what the difference was between an encounter and a stop and an arrest um, I wanted to find out, and I also agree that someplace, I understand uh, Judge Leonard's um, um, kind of issue, and I, I can, with putting those definitions in there because they are fluid and sometimes change, and we may not keep up with that, um, and that there, and it's courts that make those decisions. And it's not necessarily the officer that ends up at, ends up in court, and that's what kind of determines what kind of encounter it was or stop. Um, but I do believe that there probably should be something in there somewhere. Whether this is the place to have it, or whether it's somewhere else in the policy, in their whole, in their whole palm, that would be uh, something for the police maybe to decide, or maybe for us. But really, yes or no questions for uh, Mr. Gissner and Officer McGuire. Mr. Gissner, or I'm not sure which one to go first. Maybe uh, Officer McGuire. Um, do you feel that you have a very clear understanding of the difference between what would be an encounter and a stop? Yes, I do. Even, I though, do. even though it's not written, you have a very yeah. clear um, understanding as, of the uh, we've been through our case laws, uh, case law updates, um, there are certain things that I can do and cannot do. Um, for example, if I order someone to give me their ID, and uh, that would be something like uh, if I were to stop somebody and they say, and I ask for their ID and they say, no, you can't have it. I said, well, you have to give it to me. This is a stop. And the, versus me just walking up to somebody, hey, how's it going? You know, hey, uh, do you see any crime going on here? You know, and just sort of work my way into a, a conversation that way. I would consider that an encounter. So I, I do personally, and I think the majority of our department does as well. Hey, can I my uh, They are very well trained. Um, as a bureaucrat and um, as uh, someone who worked as a DOJ consultant, and um, when you see departments on the court order, the expectation is that it's in the policies and procedures so that there's no doubt that this is your textbook, this is what we expect you to know. Um, I do think, I'm certain that uh, Officer McGuire uh, knows exactly what he's supposed to do. This reinforces it. And I guess that's where sort of then the philosophical differences come into play, <coughs> is how detailed. And as I said, in six or eight specific areas, uh, I am 100 convinced, 100% convinced that the detail needs to be in there, in the textbook. We're almost running out of time. I we have we are out of person. time. We are out of time. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to have to uh, ask. Would you like to not have the opportunity for Chama to speak? Would you like to yeah, answer? we're going to have to move on because uh, we expected the panel beat her 7.30, and I don't want to impose on them any longer than that. We're already running <coughs> over, and whatever we do now will impact the rest of our meeting. So I need to 
assure those people who had questions that there is still another avenue. After we're done with our break, you will have an opportunity to speak publicly. You just need to fill out a blue sheet. We have 20 minutes set aside for public comment. Uh, the blue sheets are at the back, and if you'll just give those to Carter, who's sitting at the table back there, you'll have an opportunity to ask those questions. And, of course, if any of the panel would like to stick around, we'd be happy to have you here to uh, speak with folks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much again for the perspective that we give today. <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would. That's fine. I can. I just. Uh, I'll get the opportunity to make in my the, comments and the context. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. No, we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Can I do my own comment? Card? I'll get in the queue. Don't worry. <laughs> I raised my hand. Mine isn't earth shattering anyway. Jake calls me during the middle of the meeting, so I, I ignored it and said, um, you know, I, I can't, I can't talk now. What do you need? He's like, can you bring me a burrito home for dinner? I'm like, I won't be home until nine. Maybe you need to ask Dad. I have no idea where Jason's at. No, they really didn't. Either I'm a really bad time or uh, I just don't care. I think they just care. I think we better hold it up. It's hard. It's hard at the end of the three minutes to just get this out at the three minutes. You did a good job. And there's, there's some people that have a good one to do that. I like it that I have these signs. I'm going to start using them at work. I always tell everybody there that when I have a meeting, I really want to comment. I won't let me have a I am really lucky I have a small team. Well, yeah. <laughs> so everybody gets a chance. When you have a big group, everybody doesn't have a chance. I have a Wednesday meeting that probably has 15 people in it. And there's a couple that just sort of go on when they want to talk about something. So I'm not going to talk to <laughs> we have that. Yeah. We definitely have that. We need to get some more water. Hey, and you're in Lake Lodge, so you're in water. Uh, thank you. Why For what? Water oh, wait, wait. I'm not allowed to have a covered water. <laughs> They're not allowed to have any, any oh, food or drink. I'm the only one that's got it up here. <laughs> No, 40 something years is only two, in like 30 something years he's been here. There's only two. Um, and that, and that's what I like. Johnny Lake. Richardson.
Are you changing something? Well, we bring him down here. Better because we won't have to. Okay. Yeah, and then let's move this. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if I should ask you or yeah. Can you wait just a second? Well, you better sit down. Wherever you want me. Huh? Wherever you want me. Close by. <laughs> Here. Or there. Thank you. Hi. Sure. This is uh, your uh, Miss uh, Missy from uh, Eugene Weekly. That's right. We met you were at one of the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the policy by March, right? Yeah, I, I, I don't want to work from memory, but um, yeah, we had a Gantt chart that showed that exactly how we want what we want completed when, so that we could have a pilot project in place by July. So I don't know the dates off the top of my head, but we can get them to you. Carter Holly, who's the staff person at the table back here, can say, yeah. Like to get a pilot project in place by July. But we're, we're hearing from the contractor, Sunyard, it's a, a firm that sold us the software. So that might be delayed. 
Huh? Yeah, but that's yeah, that's the that happens sometimes. Hey Bob, you might want to sit on this side to let the public. Whatever you want. So no, I'll go back. Yeah, Whatever you want. Yeah. You sit anywhere you like. That way we have we no name have tag tonight. People that are when I speak, they can come and sit over here. Yeah, mm -hmm. There's so much that can go wrong. Yeah, yeah, we have one uh, microphone that had to be held oh. in a certain way. <laughs> I'm just looking yeah, at the, a bad mic. I'm just looking at the wires here. Hmm? I'm just looking at the wires. Maybe safer for you and Tamara to stay here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they just stay here because that way the people okay. don't have to mess with the wires. All right. And I have the public come over this side. Oh, I see what yeah. you're saying. Oh. I didn't notice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's do it that way. Well, the microphone should be in the middle. So. We can uh, we can move if you think it's better. Whatever you want. Those lights are too bright up there. You know, my eyes are. I want it. Yeah. Can we move down, the down here? The camera is over here. I like it down here. He wants the folks to be able to sit here, you know, so it's closer for them to come up to the table. It makes more sense. I like to be able to see the whites of your eyes. Well, you're catching me at a good time in my life, then. It was a brief period in college where those were yellow. <laughs> Put that on my list of big mistakes. Everybody can come back to the table, please, the commissioners. Thank you. Chief, your stuff right there. Oh, thank you. But I think you the realm of the conversation, especially this time. I don't know what the Irish version of leprechauns is, but yeah. they took care of you. How's your trip? The little oh, people, anyway. No, they're just uh, they're getting back from uh, I will probably have to do my life. Apparently, I do. Apparently, I just can't get enough of them. I'm crazy. Is that a big bright lights? The big city? It is a big by this celebration fellow over here. Uh, because because the only normal people I know right. are those but that I just met. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I figure I already got the bullseye tattoo. Her daughter as well put it to use. You know. No, you're not, but that's not what she was saying. <laughs> <laughs> Big drunk in this. Sorry. Okay. Okay. I'll okay. cope. I'll cope and adjust. Thank you, everyone, for returning to the table. So, um, at this time, I'd like to open the meeting to public comment. Uh, we're a little bit behind, but we're going to let everyone that uh, wants to speak do so. So. You've got the blue sheets. You want to call the first one? Yes, I will. So by first, um, first we have Majeska C. Screen, followed by Deb Fresh. Majeska, thank you. <clears throat> Hi. This will be very brief. Just two things that I hope for more information about. Um, one is. Um, Asking again, uh, hopefully in, in your discussion on the, the policy today, I hope for a little more clarification about what the intention is about including socioeconomic status. Um, and second, um, asking again if there's any update on the, um, the thing that Council um, asked staff to work on for uh, some sort of matching networking thing for homeless people who are homeless and those who, you know, people who have a place being able to be matched up with people who need a place. And um, uh, I, uh, hopefully there's some kind of update that you can hear tonight, but I also wonder if somebody from the police commission could please ask for an update on that so that it can be, you know, an official <coughs> thing that, that you folks get. Um, I'll, I'll say again, I, I really believe that uh, public safety for all concerned is, is so relevant, so important in that topic. And, you know, as it uh, impacts the individuals who need a place, the individuals who might have a, a, a place where they can host, and also for the neighborhoods around them. And there really needs to be more action than I've been able to see so far on this because there's such a great need for it. I mean, there's people in this room who really need something like that, that matching network as soon as possible. 
um, just because of issues of, of safety that they have to face when they have to look at what options they have. Thank you. Thank you, please. Deb Frisch, followed by uh, Neil Van Steenburen. <clears throat> In the past, Police Commission minutes contained a paragraph summarizing the comments of each public speaker that was detailed enough that you could understand the gist. Now the minutes include a sentence or two for each speaker, and it's almost impossible to discern the speaker's point. The situation with the City Council is even worse. There is one line per speaker, including the speaker's name. That's about six words per speaker. But if your name is something like Vladimir von Kuperwich, there would be word for a, there would be room for a two-word summary. Vladimir von Kuperwich uttered words. Speaking of disrespect for the public, um, there was no time for the public to ask any questions of the panelists. And as you can see, even in the public comments, there's no opportunity since 100% of them left. Even Mark Gissner, who claims to be interested in the policy you're going to discuss later. Commissioner Valle said we can talk at the public forum as if this substituted for asking the panelists questions. This wasn't just disrespectful, it was intellectually insulting. Of course, the disrespect for the public pales in comparison to the disrespect shown for women and African Americans in the composition of the panel. The total number of people, including the police commission in the panel, was 13 men and three women. If Claire had been here, it would have been 13 men and four women and the panel had five men and two women. Women make up 50% of the population and 28% of the panel. In contrast, Latinos were extraordinarily overrepresented on the panel. Four of the seven panelists were advocates for Latino, the Latino community. Latinos make up maybe 20% of the population, but 58% of the panel. African Americans were disrespected just like women. African Americans are most likely to be victims of bias-based policing, but had no representation on the panel. The perverse irony of the gender and race bias on the bias-based policing panel is troubling to say the least, as is the fact that the one woman on the police commission was not allowed to ask questions, just like the public. So white male bias <coughs> is alive and well on the Eugene Police Commission, and especially on the bias-based um, subcommittee. A few comments on the speakers. There was an excellent point raised by Mr. Newbeck. Um, stopping old cars is evidence of socioeconomic bias since old, you know, poor people have old cars. But old cars are also more likely to have broken taillights and um, other sort of malfunction. So it's kind of hard to differ. It's really a complex sort of task to say whether it's socioeconomic bias or old cars really are more likely to have stoppable offenses. I strongly disagreed with Ms. Hecht, um, who said that more discretion is needed. Discretion act the more discretion people have, the more bias there is, as Mark Gissner pointed out very eloquently. The example she gave actually proved the opposite of her point. The fact that the chief let her go is because she was an attractive woman in a fancy vehicle. If a black man had been driving with his lights off and didn't have insurance, he would have been in the slammer on January 1st. I was most impressed by Mark Gissner. He made an excellent point that the policy should say um, what, should, what should be done, not just what's not in it. And I told, um, I wanted to summarize and make sure that I get something I mean in the minutes. Um, Deb Frisch protested the brevity of summaries of public comments and protested the um, extraordinary racial and gender bias on the bias-based policing panel. Thank you. Thank you. Neil, thank you for coming up to the table. And then I have uh, Carol Burrow Caldwell as our last speaker. If there's anybody else in the audience that would like to, the opportunity to speak, please fill out a blue form and bring it forward to me. Welcome. I'm Neil Van Steenberg. Two points. What I bring to the table and a challenge. I bring 12 years of membership on the Human Rights Commission, two years of membership on the Police Commission, in 1998, I was one of a group of only slightly diverse 17 Eugene citizens who formed a committee to put together a ballot measure for an independent police auditor. We lost by 300 votes. The police commission emerged out of that loss. A little over a year later, a second vote was held and we passed. Um, I continue to co-facilitate multiple, multiple workshops on racism, diversity, 
um, privilege. With Greg Brickoff, I developed a number of years ago a program of advocates in town that supported members of this community who suffered discrimination and harassment. One of the highlights of that program was to have a group of mediators that met between community members and members of the police department to talk about issues that community members and police officers had that they didn't have a chance to talk about. We rarely came to a written <coughs> agreement, which is usual in mediation, because at the end of the mediation, almost without exception, both officers and community members said, all I wanted to do was to be listened to and respected, and I never ever had been respected. That didn't surprise me to hear that from community members. It was important for me to hear that police officers had not felt respected by community members. So that need for respect is, is there. Um, I also bring the privilege that I have as an accident of my birth. White, heterosexual, culturally dominant, middle class, housed, relatively able-bodied, elder, educated male. <coughs> With that privilege, um, I also bring the bias that is consciously and unconsciously, individually and institutionally, a part of who I am. My voice is represented and always has been at all the tables in Eugene. There are multiple voices in this community that are not represented. Um, my challenge to myself and to you is to remind myself and you that no matter how good-hearted we are, no matter how much you and I have worked and continue to work on our own bias, remnants of it individually and institutionally still exist. They're still there. Those of us with privilege, and we all have some privilege, have the hardest time overcoming it. I can give you multiple, multiple, multiple examples of bias in this community. Not against me, against people I have been willing to listen to. And it takes, <laughs> takes a conscious decision on my part to listen to those people. So I want to challenge you, I want to challenge myself, I want to challenge this group, I want to challenge the community. Um, you have an opportunity as a police commission and as a department to revisit this, to come at this bias policy with strength. You have my outspoken and unqualified support. I and others will pay attention to you. I came to Eugene 21 years ago at the age of 66. There's been relatively little change in those 21 years. I'm hoping I won't have to wait another 21 years. <laughs> Dave Frohnmeyer, when he was president of the university, said, Eugene is a smugly liberal racist town. It still is. I'd like to leave with you the most recent copy of the intelligence report from the Southern Poverty Law Center, the main organization in this country for years on hate crimes. There's a bit on the back page about how it can help police departments, also on page two. It speaks about uh, hate crimes in Oregon. I wish you well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, I have Carol Burke Caldwell, followed by Melissa Wellington. Carol Burke Caldwell, 2510 Augusta. For 47 months near daily, I've engaged in court observing at Eugene Muni Court. Perhaps my notes will one day be useful, particularly for matters that reek to me a possible bias-based policing. I observed a hearing just this morning that was by no means anomalous. A young Latino was cited for driving with no license. He told the judge the officer said he pulled me over because my license plate light was too bright. Let me repeat. He said he was told the reason for the stop was because his license plate light was too bright. I've seen hearings for motorists cited for no license plate light. Police do, after all, need to read the plates at night. But a light too bright? Well, perhaps there is a law forbidding license plate lights being too bright. I'll leave that to our police auditor's office and internal affairs to delve into. For promptly after this hearing, I filed a third-party complaint with the police auditor's office on behalf of community, akin to another complaint I'd filed about a year ago after seeing numerous Latinos in court cited for not waiting a full hundred feet after signaling before changing lanes. That went nowhere, uh, allegedly because there just wasn't enough data. I remain appalled 
appalled over the, what Latinos are sharing with me about the profiling done against them. This young man also told the judge, Your Honor, the officer did not cite me for the too bright license plate light. He cited me for not having a license. Judge asked him if he could get a license. He said no, fined 175 bucks. Numerous Latinos have told me how police pulled them over on site to ask for their licenses. I hope soon that provisional licenses can be granted to Latinos who have not yet obtained citizenship. Three and a half years ago, I met with an, a, an EPD lieutenant troubled at what I was beginning to see roll out in court. He told me police ticket Latinos in order to get them to fix the problem of not having a license. I felt surprised. Could it be this officer was unaware people who lack citizenship papers can't fix the problem? But here's a problem that I hope can be fixed. For we fancy ourselves in Eugene as being tolerant, progressive, humane. <coughs> Yet we're tolerating a system that allows the ticketing of people for the so-called crime of driving while brown. Let's require police have a clear, obvious traffic violation in play before pulling Latinos over. Let's fix that. Here's a friendly tip before driving home tonight. Check your license plate light. Make sure it's not too bright. On the other hand, if your face isn't brown, it's likely you'll have very little to worry about. For the record, I firmly believe the majority of EPD are not biased and do conduct themselves ethically. But I'm sure that there are many who do not. I mean, there are some who do not, excuse me, make that correction. If there's any at substance to the rumor Eugene is tolerant, progressive, humane, perhaps these few Iran police will one day be held accountable or at least fired. After all, we spend $400,000 a year on our police auditor's office program and money spent on our police commission and equity human rights center. With all this taxpayer money spent and dedicated people serving on these boards and commissions, surely we can achieve results addressing widespread community concerns about alleged bias-based policing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And our last speaker is Melissa Wellington. Melissa Wellington. Um, I'd like okay. to talk really quickly about intention and discretion and power. Um, <coughs> I believe that it's good for the police officers to have discretion and that should be respected. At the same time, I'm not sure that intention is all that matters. I think you don't want to squash the bug. How many of you see the bug under your foot before you step on it? Okay, so you step on it. <laughs> Did you intend to step on it? No? Is it still dead? Yeah, okay. So that would be like discrimination, killing the bug. But what if you just kind of like are waving your arms in the air, right? You still could kill a bug. What if there's a bumblebee? Bumblebees are annoying. They, maybe not a bumblebee, maybe a yellow, yellow jacket. Okay, that thing's annoying. It's making a lot of noise. It looks threatening. Is it threatening because it's scared of you? Ponder. What is your reaction to it like? I think there's an awareness that could occur between police and the people. That could be two-way and could involve the reactions, an awareness of each other's reactions, how we're responding to each other as people. This doesn't go. It doesn't involve bias. It doesn't involve discrimination. It involves just noting the other person and what they're doing. And maybe that's what you mean by observation. And if so, that's great. Maybe documenting the facts about the behavior would help people who think they're being profiled. So if they come to you and say, you know, we're Latin and near this color, but, you know, um, so it seems like. A lot of police interactions make people fearful, but people fear people who are showing fear, and that's a crazy thing. But if you stop and realize that most people are kind of like a little bit scared of the police, and don't take the opportunity to like exploit their weakness, but just go along with them and say, okay, I understand you're afraid, here's what we're going to do. Lay out a plan and let people know what's going on. I, I just, I think... If there's a training for that, okay. But I, I believe that Chief Kearns has that in mind, and hopefully, hopefully we can just not squash the bug and be aware of the bug. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our public forum. I'll turn the time back over to Bob.
Thank you. At this moment, we will take a few minutes to approve the minutes from the last <coughs> meeting. Commissioners, hopefully, have uh, read all of the minutes and are aware of any changes that need to be made. Here, a motion for approval. So moved. Second. Moved by Juan Carlos, seconded by Edward Perry. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed. The motion is carried and the minutes are approved. Moving now to the topic of um, the professional police contact policy. Uh, we've, we've gone over in our time, so we're not going to be able to get the full time on this, but this is a ongoing process that I promise <coughs> that we, everybody will have a say in it and everybody will uh, be able to uh, get their input. We, we may not impact the policy because uh, there are considerations. The administration needs to have it done. And so we may not make a change. <coughs> certainly, that we will let administration know and staff what how we feel about the issue and make it known to them. So we're going to take our time with it. We're going to carry it over to the next meeting until we get it right. Okay, and everybody in accord with that? So, Tamara, you have first go because you're carried over from uh, the uh, queue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I really appreciated the uh, panel that we had today. Um, they, I, I, they made some tremendous comments, um, made um, some good points. Um, for me, um, I, I was absent from the meeting last time, so I read um, carefully through the minutes from the last meeting, and it looks like there were a couple motions made. Um, you know, when this policy first came out, I kind of read through it, and I said, well, definitions are good. It's great to have definitions at the beginning of the policy. And then as I kind of started reading more through it, I think it's important to have these definitions in here. But when I got to section 402.2 in the second paragraph, it seemed like um, things were inconsistently, um, inconsistently or repeatedly mentioned about the classes and the and uh, racial or cultural difference, protected status. We got that mentioned <coughs> several times in the second paragraph. And it sort of seems like it's repeating itself a little to me. So I, I think if... Um, if we're going to look at definitions and we're going to use in our definition section racial profiling and bias based profiling protected class um, as long as those things are accurate and are um, reflective of the current uh, law i think that's great to have those in there but i don't think we need to repeat um, those classes and those um, those characteristics or those um, things again inside the policy i think that we need to refer just back to our definitions so for example um, in the second paragraph of 402.2, um, I was looking through this and I, I said, you know, okay, so in the third line it talks about um, equitable law enforcement services to the community with due regard for racial or cultural, and we've processed out other differences and, and put protected status. And then farther down um, at the end of that paragraph, it says discriminating towards any individual or group. And then on the top of the second page, it mentioned it goes through a list of things again that are a portion of the things that are mentioned in the definition. So. I, I understand what um, Mark Gissner was getting at with saying, you know, do we need to um, maybe give a little more do's in here instead of just don'ts, and maybe that is something that we want to do, but I think this also needs to be a little bit cleaned up. Um, have all of our definitions in the definition section and not have the things individually mentioned, I think it gets really confusing when we do that in other parts of the policy. So, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is, um, um, about what uh, Officer McGuire said in the panel, which was about explanation. I realize that um, it's been um, very difficult with the budget cuts that have happened in our community and what we can fund in far, as far as police services and that the focus is on preventing crime. But I do think having an explanation about why someone stopped sometimes can go a long way towards re community relations. Um, because I think if the officer doesn't tell the person why they're being stopped, then they tell themselves a story about why they got stopped. And then they tell their neighbors the story, and then they tell their friends the story, and then they post it on Facebook, and that might have absolutely nothing to do with why they got stopped. Um, and so I think that that, that actually could go um, farther than, um, than you might think in an officer just taking a brief moment if they have time to explain to someone why they got pulled over because then if they get told what the story is even if they don't believe it they've still been given an explanation and they aren't going to tell themselves a different story about it thanks 
Thank you. Do you have any motion in regard to your concerns in that 402.2? No, I don't. I mean, I don't want to wordsmith the language here. Okay. I, I just want to, you know, bring that up as a point for the spirit of the. I could go through and pick out specific lines, but I think I just wanted to mention that I think that it needs to be a little cleaner there. Well, I noticed that there was, and it was mine, so I guess I noticed that the, the amendment that I made to change the language in um, 402.4.1 that was passed didn't get included in here. So that that paragraph where that, that section that says, you know, all, all contacts that involve detention must be recorded was supposed to be changed. All contacts that become a stop or arrest must be recorded. Oh, right. Remember that. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that makes a difference to our discussion. I don't know, yeah. but at least that. Error. Uh, uh, let's see. Are you? I will correct it. That me? was okay. That was, was that'll stay and correct it. Thank you, Joe. You're next in the queue, yeah, and then I, Juan Carlos. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I am in agreement with uh, what uh, Commissioner Miller said, and I would like to make it a motion that uh, we get a, a sense of the group. Uh, a sense of the commission as to whether um, all of the dimension of the classes and reasons should be moved into definitions and removed from the other sections of this. I, I think it's an excellent idea, um, and I'd like to make a motion to that effect. Okay. The motion again is to is to as as count as Commissioner Mil uh, Miller suggested. Um, is is under the the definitions it's pretty well covered and remove it from uh, section the the repetition of the depth of the protected classes from uh, section 402.2 so remove the wording regarding the definition from 402.2 is that your motion yeah and just leave it in under the 402.1.1 .1. I have a second I'll, I'll second second about Tim Okay, discussion on the motion. I'll start a new queue for that, and Mike was first on that. I have two-part question. One, to ask the chief, is there a reason for those specific class to be definitively outlined in that particular place that's of importance? Well, I would say in the interest of including uh, groups or people who may feel bias, I, I would say that it's, it's important for that reason. Um, it's also important because it's defined in, in city code and it, it um, reflects what we would be trying to accomplish in this policy. So, so it's uh, for important that, to put each of them in in the place where we're talking about potentially taking them out. I'm sorry, I must have misunderstood. No, your it's question. perfectly all right. I didn't ask it very clearly. You no. know, I'm a little easy to get to. If there, you're asking the is it appropriate to just insert the word protected class where maybe we've enumerated what yeah. those are later in the policy? I think that's perfectly appropriate. And it would, I'm in complete agreement with Ms. Okay. Ms. Miller. I just wondered if there's something we're not thinking about no. that needs to be I there. Think you're right. The second part of my question is when we begin to collect data, what I'm seeing seems to indicate that we're only going to be collecting data on race as it's perceived by the officer whether when that's mixed that may be an interesting sort of thing <clears throat> age and gender but are we concerned or should we have any part of those particular protected classes being also a part of the data set in, in complete form I mean as long as we're going to definitively say these are people for whom or these classes of people are for whom we should have special consideration in those cases should we be collecting data on all of them? It's really a conversation for the commission. I can offer my opinion if you'd like. But okay. Would you like me to answer that? I'd love to have any your opinion, and I'd, yeah, I'd be interested to know what other people thought too, but certainly, um, yeah. I think uh, it's important to start small mm -hmm. um, initially because uh, there's so many moving parts with this mm -hmm. and we will get to the point where we have the entire workforce um, inputting data on 
you know, contacts, mm -hmm. whether they're encounters or stops or arrests. Um, but uh, there are so many discretion, I mean, uh, so many uh, classes in there that are left to the subjective view mm -hmm. of the police officer that I think it's risky to begin with all of that. And um, the new records management system is consuming a lot of our officers' time now, and we haven't started collecting data. So yeah. if we can start small, learn what we can uh, from uh, our observations of classes that are um, more easy, easily uh, identified, then I think we'd be better off initially. Okay. Then we have Juan Carlos, and then Tamara, and then myself, and the Q, anybody else? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I respect that my colleagues in wanting to to be more concise and, and non-repetitive, but I think it will be a mistake for this language to go away. The A lot of the policy uh, language has to state and set the, the tone for the rest of the policy. And I see that there is definitions in most policies that we worked on to define what you're going to be working on. But the rest of it has to do with guiding an officer, basically giving direction or guiding an officer into how to go about doing the work. And unfortunately, we're not 30 years from now in which we don't need to remind officers that they have to do the work based on behavior, not on their potential biases. So while I understand the intent, the impact of removing the language as I stated in how it creates the tone for the rest of the policy will be a mistake. Please tell me that you've heard a lot of the panelists speak their perspectives. Okay, Tamara? Um, I don't know if I misunderstood that or not. My intention was not to have the definitions removed from 402.1.1, um, maybe even added to if they uh, need to be or augmented. Interrupt you, but that's not the yeah. motion. Right. Joe made. Joe made the motion to leave them in. I understand. And only take it out from the other parts. Right? I understand. <clears throat> My what I said before, um, when when I uh, spoke before the motion was, you know, I'm not suggesting removing these from the um, from the definitions. I was just suggesting not repeating the same words in the same classes throughout the policy. For example at the last sentence of um, section 402.2 where it says the department will provide equal protection under the law to the people we contact and provide it fairly and without discrimination toward any individual or group i'm not suggesting this exact language but just in the spirit of what i'm saying we could say there instead um, to the people we contact and provide it fairly and without using racial profiling or uh, bias-based profiling and without discrimination towards any protected class. I mean, mm -hmm. the whole point in the way you write policies, if you have definitions at the beginning, you shouldn't re be repeating the words that are in the definition, again, in the body of the policy. That's why you define them at the beginning. So you don't need to repeat all the words again. That's just a formatting thing that I was um, trying to get at that would make the policy more efficient. Um, the second thing that I wanted to say is um, about outreach for data collection, since we're talking about that as well. Um, about data collection is I did have the opportunity to speak with um, with uh, Carbon Urbina after the uh, panel spoke and I think that she makes a good point I think that um, what Chief Kern said about starting small and making sure you do it well is I think a really good point she agreed with that and also said about uh, made the point about outreach and um, when she talked about the Social Security policy when that was rolled out to the public again the explanation about people want to know why she mentioned to me that she and Chief Kearns went around to multiple groups in the community and spoke to the community about this is happening, this is why it's happening, this is why we're doing it. And I and I don't know what the plan is for that, but I think she makes a good point about that is important, again, the explanation about why, so the community knows what's going on. So hopefully the word gets out and when somebody gets stopped and they, they maybe get asked a question, that's one of the data collection points, they understand why it's being asked. So um, that was my point about that, thanks. Thank you. I have removed my name from the queue to speak on the motion, so Edward, you're next. Um, I have to say I agree with putting all the definitions at the front of the policy. That's normal, but it would also make them consistent because they are not throughout the policy. Um, source of income is listed in the definitions in the first paragraph. That shifts to economic status in another paragraph. 
Those are different things. Um, so one set of definitions to which the rest of the policy refers to is both a normal process and would avoid that. It says one thing in this paragraph is protected. It says another thing in this paragraph is protected. I think that's the only point I have on this motion. Well, could you could you show me where it says a source of income? I see right here. It. Uh, in protected class, third paragraph, oh, four two class, one point one. I was looking up in bias, yeah. please. Uh, right. It says economic yeah. status in there. Exactly. In the top of, so uh, top of the next page has economic status. Okay, I'm back in the queue again. So is economic status any? What is the difference between economic status and source, source of, of income? income? Well, yeah. if you have no source of income, you still have an economic status. <laughs> yeah, but even if you do have income, you still are in an economic status. It just in many communities, I've, I've seen officers ask the question, <clears throat> You know, what do you do for a living? What's your source of income? There are communities that okay. forbid panhandling and begging, and that's a litmus test. Is are you in town here to beg? Do you have a job? Uh, that's one one set of profiling, quite frankly. Um, if the answer is yes, I have a job. I don't have Thank to you. tell you where I am in the economic status or what my clout is. Okay. I understand. Like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, I have issues with the whole concept here that we'll talk about at some point, but staying on on point with specifically this motion, is there any further discussion on this motion? Just this one issue? No? Okay, and we'll call for vote. All those in favor of Joe's motion to leave the definitions in 402.1.1 and not put them in the rest of the policy signify by holding up your hand. Okay. All opposed? Like sign. Thank you. Motion carries. We're moving on back to the other queue where we started, and Juan Carlos, you were in there to speak on, I presume, another issue. I do. I, I, I'm conflicted by the last motion that was made in terms of um, replacing all detentions must be recorded with all stops being recorded. <coughs> and I'm conflicted because we've been talking about that I don't want police officers to stop my kids and that not being recorded anywhere. And I don't know if that stop, specifically the way it was denied by, the way it was defined and presented by a commissioner, in fact is going to capture or not capture that after all. So I ref just to refresh your memory, so the issue is that some kids out there are being contacted or presumably detained by officers. When we contact the police department, there is no record that they've been detained or stopped. And so the new definition in the way it was replaced, is that going to capture that? If it's not, then we really didn't make any progress in terms of making sure that the kids are being detained I don't, I'm not discussing the reason they're being detained or the reason they're in contact. What I'm discussing about is that that has to be recorded so that we can follow up on that. So if somebody, especially the person that made the motion, thinks that is going to capture, then I'll be okay with that part. Um, well, um, the chair is going to rule that we've already, that tr train has already said, uh, taken off. So we, we voted on this. We made it a motion. Uh, it passed. And unless someone wants to make a motion to reconsider the motion and change the language back, we're not going to discuss that part of it because it's pointless. If somebody's not going to reconsider it, then why are we discussing it? It's, it was just a comment on, on the table. That's it was fine. not a request for the motion, right but, but I wanted to make it part of the record, okay, thank Mr. You. Chairman. And Edward? It's a technical question uh, about that. Chief, correct me if I'm wrong, but if an officer in a car sees somebody on the side of the street he'd like to speak to, is he or she <coughs> communicating to dispatch that they are out of service for that? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that stop, that encounter is captured in time and space in the dispatch, mm -hmm. but perhaps not in detail. Is that right? That's right. Okay. That's, that's really all I have to ask. Thank you. Um, we only got a few minutes left before the end of the meeting, so I want to be able to give every commissioner a chance to go around the table in the few minutes that are remaining. If you have comments about the, the panel, 
discussion. Personally, I'd like to thank Juan Carlos for the time and effort that uh, yes. he, his leadership in getting this together, but especially would also like to thank Bill and Edward and Joe for the conscientious attendance to the committee. Um, you guys have done a, a terrific job in getting this together, getting it you know, out here for the public, and we're not done yet. We are having a meeting on April 3rd. Uh, that's a, a, a public community um, forum to for people to speak out. And I would hope that the commissioners can make that a part of their calendar. They would attend and be part of it and uh, show the support that, that we should have for the committee in addition. So I hope everybody can make that. I'm planning on going. Um, we will continue the discussion on this at the next meeting and continue to iron out issues. So I, I ask you to be prepared. If you have motions, let's be prepared to make them and vote on them. It's going to be a little more efficient going in. I think I've let folks talk about it without actually putting it into a motion form, and that gets that may drag the meeting on. We just don't have the time to do that. Uh, it, it's a luxury. We can discuss the motion when we make one, but we need to stick to the motions. Okay. So going around the table, is, uh, we'll start on this side. Mike, you want to start out? I echo his thanks. Okay. Ditto. Thank you, everybody. Good meeting. <coughs> yeah, the panel was great. I was calculating that the panel brought almost over 145 years of experience of mm -hmm. their own and being out in the trenches. Yeah. And I, yeah, looking I at their faces and all the things they've been through, of course, I haven't. I've been around for this community for 24 years only, and yet they've been out there even longer than that. So the public forum that we're going to have on the 3rd, I hope that more people will show up because that's the intention of capturing that and bringing it before you. I am proud of the committee and the, the way they went out selecting the panel. I think we came up with a very good selection. There was many multiple recommendations. And the ultimate, the ultimate list, I am proud of that. There's some issues that we all as community have to deal with, and we have to deal them head on. Racism and discrimination is not an easy topic to discuss, especially when it comes to policy, especially when it comes to impact and intent. And that is also uh, kind of a sign of the times that we are. We have quite a bit of things to do. But at the same time, I also appreciate that you guys' flexibility and willingness to come to the table and talk, because that's important. The reason why we're not talking, we're not discussing, we're not arguing, is when it really gets dangerous. So, thank you. Uh, just thank everybody. In the essence of time, I will keep it very short. Yeah, I already gave my speech tonight. Thank you all for uh, listening to the panel tonight. Okay. Bob, I do have one item. The questions that didn't get asked from the audience, could uh, those be put into the minutes? Uh, uh, they weren't discussed by the commission, and I would say no. I would say they wouldn't. Could we get them as an addendum of some nature to that so that uh, all of us know what the questions were? Or maybe we put that tomorrow. held then forward then to the correctly. community forum, perhaps. Well, it, it, we won't be able to ask the, the yeah, specific we'll questions to the panel. Sure. But I think, it would, I think it would be good if, if we could attach it as an addendum, if mm -hmm. that's acceptable. That makes it a public record. You're correct. Yes, that'll be part of the public record. It just didn't need to be part of the minutes because we didn't discuss it. So I agree. That'd be, that'd be fine. I'm passing it down. Good. Good evening. Carter? Okay. Yeah. Any others? Uh, Tamara, yes. You have the last <laughs> word. <laughs> I almost didn't get it. <laughs> 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 you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. Um, Good to have the last word. Um, I wanted to really thank the um, bias-based uh, committee and the um, the for the organization of the forum. I thought it was excellent. Just great speakers had a lot to say. Great job, you guys, um, organizing it and running it. And I'm looking forward to the public hearing. And thank you for doing all the work that you did to make that happen. Thank you. All right, we're adjourned. The forum on the third is where when? Here. 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 At what time? 530. 530. 530. 530. This, this one is 530 on yep. Carter? Yes. Okay. It'll be up on the city website, Mike. Right? Carter, so we'll send you ample notice. Mike, what do you do? I didn't realize we can tell you how to get there if you want to. Yeah. Right? I know, but I I wasn't focused on the sign. I wanted to say hi to everyone. She's just a real I don't follow a lot of rules to you. I don't follow a lot of rules. And it's recorded me drinking my drink during the movie. That's nice. So what does the city council do?